Hi, this is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth, your video cast that's designed to help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. Designed for entrepreneurs and other listeners all across the country, brought to you by Zell Law, your sponsor. And today with me, my special guest is an entrepreneur in the nonprofit sector, Katrina Van Hus. Welcome, Katrina. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Katrina and I have known each other for a long, long time, so I'm not going to get into that background, but we're very good friends, and we've, we date back to the early 1900s. No, just, it's, yes, been, it's so. been a long time since we've known each other, but I'll give you a little bit of background on her. She is the CEO of a company called Turnkey, which is a U.S.-based strategy and execution firm for social good, something other than just business, social good. This is great. Katrina has been seeding social good since 1989 when she founded the company. Turnkey helps a variety of nonprofits, but here are some really uh, very well-known brands that she's helped. The Susan G. Komen Foundation, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, ALS, near and dear to my heart, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and other organizations, including UNICEF, all across the world. She has written two books uh, one is called Dollar Dash. Uh, she wrote that with her husband, Otis Fulton. And another book that they wrote together is called Social Fundraising. So today we're going to talk about the whole idea, the whole concept of using branding, of using marketing, of using social media and building brand identity for social good. What does that mean, Katrina? I mean, when I say we're, we're actually doing branding for social good, Give me some examples of that. Sure. So um, I'll use a little different language. And thanks for having me, number one. And thanks for the great dinner I had with you recently, number two. Um, And social good, you know, it's all the same function as in a for-profit business, but we use a lot of different words. And so um, in for-profit, you would use the word uh, customer satisfaction. And in nonprofit, we use constituent satisfaction, all the same. And driven often by many of the same things. Um, there are some limitations on what, uh, how we approach our market of constituents and differences in the way that we do that. The thing we sell first and foremost, if we're good at it, is happiness and hope. That's what we sell. And so when we do well, we sell that really bre- really well. It manifests through our brand. It manifests through our event design. It manifests through you know, the, the words that we use. When we do it poorly, we end up selling stuff. As soon as nonprofit transitions to selling like, you know, ride in a three day weekend for a mere $2,000 in fundraising, we're selling stuff and not hope. But really savvy marketers, um, for example, the CEO of uh, Pan Mass Challenge I was on with this morning, very savvy marketer, and he understands at the heart of it, he's not selling a, a two or three day bike ride. He is selling hope and connection, love. Um, that's when we're doing it well. And that's the kind of language that we use. So give me an example of how you did that, say, with Susan Komen, because we all know what Susan Komen is there to uh, mitigate, alleviate uh, the consequences of breast cancer, uh, really helping uh, women deal with that. What did you do for them? We've uh, ridden alongside them for quite a long time, you know, a client one day, not a client the next, a client the next day, you know, so when you've been in business 34 years, it's everybody's always a client. Um, So when we first met Susan G. Komen, they were going great guns. Like it was just, everybody wanted to do this walk. But at the end of the day, what happened was you signed up for a walk with 28,000 of your closest friends and, and it was a party. You bought a party and then you went home with some swag. And that business model as compared to something else I'll describe really didn't raise enough money to uh, to make the, the impact on breast cancer research that we wanted. So another model to use a comparison, yeah. uh, Relay for Life, you know, they raised at their zenith $435 million a year. And the way they did it was very different. The way they did it was, hey, how about you come over, you start the party, you make the party, you cook the food, you bring the stuff, you bring your friends, and let's do it that way. And those are really two different models. And you can see that the interaction on the Relay for Life side was about connection. It was about doing things with other people. It was a potluck homemade meal versus a buffet at Lone Star, right? Right. And so uh, the the potluck homemade meal won and raised much more money over time. 
Really? Uh, much. So, so the fancy galas, the fancy galas that Leukemia and mm-hmm. Lymphoma Society has every year, or you know, other other organizations I've been involved with. Yeah. Do they really raise that much money, or is there a better way to do it? Um, so one of the foibles, and I, I want to let me finish with Susan G. Cummins. Yeah, Susan G. Cummins figured it out. They figured it out. They're smart people, and they figured it out. They're like, hey, this is not selling anymore. It sold big and made some money because it was new and different, right? Okay. And their message was great. But they, under a super smart CEO, Paula Schneider right now, they are transitioning their model to incorporate some of the goodness that Relay for Life taught us. So they are, they are approaching it in a very smart way. So galas, that's a really good question. Um, when you think about nonprofit and you think about the different ways that they raise money, it's like different departments in any other business. You got your, uh, if you were a grocery store, you'd have your fruits and vegetables, you'd have your canned goods, you'd have your meats. Um, those are all different ways to, make, to raise money. In nonprofit, we segment those in an irrational way, in a not very healthy way. So galas, for example, do they have a high net only if, they raise a gargantuan amount gross because the expenses are so significant. Right. But people, when they go to the grocery, they don't just shop in one aisle. They shop in all the aisles. And so there's a deep interconnection between all the different ways that nonprofits raise money. The people at the gala may also be walking in a walk. They may also be a direct response donor. Um, So that gala serves more purposes than just the money that night. And that is true of every silo inside of a nonprofit. You know, I've been involved with some galas and different organizations. I was on the board of um, the Children's Charities Foundation for a long time, and then Mm -hmm. Northern Virginia Family Service, which is a huge organization up here in Northern Virginia, helping in a variety of areas. They're a wonderful organization. Um, Every year, we'd have a gala at at one or the Mm -hmm. other uh, organizations. When COVID hit, and we had to do it uh, remotely, we actually raised more money net than we did in the in-person tuxedo laden, you know, yeah. fancy wolf trap uh, get, uh, gala that, you know, you would normally expect. Now, everybody yeah. likes to get together. It's lovely to get together. But is there a new way or a different way of raising money for charity for social good? I, I'd rather use social good than charity because charity implies has a, a bad connotation sometimes. It does, it does yes. But, but social good uh, that is other than the gala, because that was our big, you know, fundraiser to reach out to the community every year. Right. There are so many clever ways to raise money. Um, the the most clever way to raise money is just to ask for it. Just <laughs> like, but it's hard to you? do that. People don't it like asking people do. for money. <laughs> And, and that's a really good point. For my dinner, thank you so much. Right. Exactly. Um, that's a very good point. People are loath to ask for anything, not just money for social good, but anything. And so all these constructs that we design are just crutches mm-hmm. to help us ask for money. But the, the most direct, lowest cost way to ask for money and raise it is to ask for money at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, people need help to do that. Now, it would be interesting, um, you know, we lean heavily on psychology in our work. It would be interesting when your event, that gala, when it pivoted to an off uh, to an online endeavor, was it a group of volunteers who managed that pivot or was it the staff? Staff. Staff managed the pivot. Yeah. So that's interesting. What we find is that the more, and I'll give you a, a story. Um, and this might be a great interview for you, and I'll make the introduction if you'd like it. <laughs> so I was on with Jarrett Collins this morning, and um, he is uh, CEO of the Pan Mass Challenge. They raised $72 million last year. Wow. They have 12 employees. Wow. 12 employees. What do they do? So how, how, uh, it is a three-day, two-day cycle event, and they have some ancillary events as well. But they are able to do that with the help of 3,000 volunteers, some of whom who have been leadership volunteers for this event for 20 years. I mean, it's just remarkable. Um, their talent and where I would take all of social good if I could get them on my back is that they have learned to empower volunteers. And those volunteers don't just supply a workforce. They supply the love, the impetus, everything. I, I would... Uh, everything. Yep. Uh, and I would bet that there's a lot of the money that comes out of that event that you could tie back to those volunteers, whether they recruited a team or they, you know, whatever it is, the money always ties back to the volunteers who lead the endeavor. How do you give the volunteers the uh, 
the pleasure, the appreciation, so that they'll continue to do this year after year. What is mm-hmm. the what is the technique, the mechanism that uh, you tell the your clients to to use to to right. really empower them and feel like they are the ones that are supporting whatever the social yeah. good cause they're supporting? The first way is the way that we've always talked about it. And the second the way is the way I prefer to talk about it. The first way is this. We really need to, and you got to put on that, like, like I really earnestly care voice and face. I, we really need to make sure our volunteers feel seen and heard and loved. I just want them to know how much we appreciate them. Fine. Here's the way I would approach that. Human satisfaction, for the most part, is built on three elements, autonomy, mastery, and, rec- and uh, oh, sh- connectedness, <laughs> autonomy. Did I, did I help this volunteer be in charge? Do they feel like they were in charge? Did they make meaningful decisions? Yes or no? How much? Um, mastery. Did we recognize them for their competence? Yes or no? And how well? And then connectedness. Did we give them a frictionless way to connect with other volunteers and other people who care about the mission? When you score a volunteer's experience on that scale, you get the real answer. But what we usually do in nonprofit is we go with the unicorns and butterflies in this face. I really care face. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how, do you, um, how do you teach these organizations and what tools do you use to teach these organizations to empower and really value the volunteers to get them engaged. Cause the story that you just yeah. gave about the, uh, the organization that raised $72 million with 12 employees, that's mind blowing. Mind blowing. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, By the, the way, best- what do they do with the money? Um, it all goes straight to the Dana Farber cancer center. Oh. The way we teach it, it's hard, right? Because here's what's a true fact about human beings. Um, human satisfaction is built on three things, autonomy, mastery, connectedness. Yes. Staff people are human. And you know what we want as staff people more than anything else is control. Yes. And if we assume control, the people we take it away from are the volunteers. And therefore right? so they lose will, their autonomy. Yes. They lose their autonomy <laughs> and they are dissatisfied and they leave. Teaching that and helping people understand that dynamic that, you know, I'm going to teach you uh, you know, about all these things and give you a new language and a new way to understand it. But you also have to acknowledge that you too are subject to all these things. So helping them become self-aware that um, that panicked sense that they have when they want to take it out of a volunteer's hands and do it themselves, mm-hmm. um, they got to overcome that. You know, that's part of your new skill set that you're building is the ability to, to trust fall. Yes, it's going to blow up. I know it's going to blow up. I'm still going to do it. You know, um, that's a new skill that many uh, executives don't have. Let me take you back a little bit. You graduated from Virginia Tech, I don't know, in, in the 1940s or something like yes. that. It was a long time ago. No, <laughs> Roughly, yes. Um, no, in the 80s. And um, what was your what was your, what did you study in school? What was your major? Oh, well, clearly I studied biology. No, no, um, I studied everything. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no course in life. I uh, have a a BS in biology, a BA in communications journalism, and a minor in human uh, nutrition. Why not? Wow. So you're doing all kinds of stuff. But the communications and journalism really is something that pulled you into. What what about that? How did that morph into uh, becoming turnkey in 1989? Because that's only a few years after you graduated. I found out I was unemployable. That's pretty much right. <laughs> and I think many entre- I think you too might be unemployable. I am unemployable. I am permanently unemployable. Yes. There's it, no I mean, question that, about it. That ask is ask my wife. She'll tell you that. I, I've heard it. Trust me. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I think that people like us just really have a hard time with the, the lack of creativity that can manifest in a W-2 job when you're not the boss. Right. right? And um, I found out that I really struggled in that environment and I didn't do well. And so jumping off into being in business is its own story. I, I, it was one of those, you're, I quit kind of conversations with my boss, you know? So, you know, I just found out I needed to do this. I grew up on a family farm and um, it was uncomfortable for me to have work so segmented from my life, you know? I was yeah. too much work-life balance. Like I didn't care enough about work and I was frustrated by it. Um, and being self-employed was much more like farming, which never ends, even on weekends and at night. 
Correct. and you're always worried about some cow getting loose, right? And it's just like being an entrepreneur. I'm always so worried about the cows getting loose here. You are, you know, you know? Uh, constantly. But that, no, that's a, that's a great analogy. Um, and when you say you your work life balance was out of whack, I I don't I don't see how that can be possible. I mean, I think if you have priorities of having a work life balance which you have achieved, uh, how can it be out of balance? I worked for a, a company called Dictaphone, which now makes me laugh. Uh, Pitney Bowes. Sure. Affiliate or a subsidiary. Yeah. And I did quite well there, but it was just weird. Like I didn't care enough about the work. I was very successful at it, but I just didn't care enough. And so when I say my work-life balance was out of whack, I didn't care at all about work. I oh, was succeeding, okay. but it didn't matter. Like I could sell a million dictaphones and who cares? It right. just didn't matter. And it right. didn't matter to me. So how did you, how did you end up going into this? Because this is a complete 180 getting yeah. into the social good world, the charitable world, yeah. if you will, the yeah. nonprofit world. Wow. What a difference. So I just picked a business. I didn't care what business it was. I just knew I wanted to be in a business. And so I picked one and that business I picked was uh, advertising specialties, logo imprinted products. Wow. That was the company I started in the beginning. It had a different name. Chachki. But one of my, Chachki, yes. One of my first clients was a wizened little lady from the American Cancer Society who really hated all her vendors. She really hated them. <laughs> and she decided she was going to build her own. And so she did. She picked me out of a crowd and she put me through some horrific stuff on the way to becoming proficient at serving her. And I did those things. Along the way, I also found this. And I still had a stable of for-profit clients when I met her. Mm -hmm. And what I found was this. Women in leadership experience what's called a double bind. Are you familiar? Please explain. Okay. Otis would do a much better job. He's my husband, social psychologist. But um, he explained to me this frustration I was feeling. And it was that anytime I was aggressive or I was clearly... Um, the expert in the room, I would get negative reactions because women don't do that, right? That's not really culturally Maybe in the 1900s, that's the case, but... Well, it's still true in really? many cases. It's still true. Yes. And what I found was that when I was working in nonprofit, it wasn't true. And the reason is this. Women get a pass for being authoritative and discerning and direct as long as they're advocating for someone else. Huh. And so I've never heard this, that before. Oh, it's, but it, it resonates. It makes sense now. Yeah. I, I yeah. can see that. Um, and that's one reason I think you see so many women in nonprofit is because it is a space where we can be utterly professional and go hard and not be judged negatively for it. Because you're always advocating for somebody else. For somebody else. That's why there yeah. are a lot of women lawyers now, too. I think it makes a lot I of sense. Bet you're right. Yeah. That makes yeah, a lot of it makes, sense. It makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. so you started this company, but it was, it was doing a lot of, you know, giveaways and, you yep. know, you buy this and you sell this and yep. give this away at the, at the event, which I remember that, you know, vividly, uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. did you get a t-shirt? Yeah. It's a t-shirt. Cool. Yeah. Or how about the hat? Uh, you know, got an extra half yeah. of my kid. How did that morph into what you're doing today? Cause it's a real, to me, that's a, also a very significant shift, but it's probably very relevant because of the internet. We were doing what's called uh, recognition programs where, you know, if you raise the thousand dollars for JDRF, we would send you a gift with a JDRF logo in it. Okay. And those gift structures were, you know, from very small, you just get a T-shirt to pretty big, you know, a three or four hundred dollar gift. Wow. And um, around the same time, the Internet happened and online fundraising happened. And what that meant is that suddenly we had a data set that we'd never had before. We'd always had like Wayne Zell raised a thousand dollars. We always had that. But what we didn't have was did Wayne Zell want his gift? And when we were able to combine those two data points over the course of one year, we found that um, Wayne wanting that gift was highly correlated to Wayne fundraising huh. and the next year. He got a but quid pro quo. He did something. He got something. That's well, actually, that's the heart of the matter. Okay. What we found once we expanded the study horizon to two years was this. If Wayne Zell raised $1,000 and got a gift that was of no consequence, you know, it didn't have a high value, then Wayne's behavior in year two would be that he would raise more. But if Wayne raised a lot of money and we gave him a super, super nice gift of consequence, in year two, Wayne would raise less. And what I'm describing 
is uh, what we call uh, insufficient what? justification. Yeah. So if you are, if you, you know, we all watch our own behavior to understand why we do things, right? Yeah. We, we interpret our own behavior and then we tell our brain what we think. It's weird, but that's how it works. So if you raised a thousand dollars and you got a super nice gift, you have two choices. You could say self, did I raise that money because I really care about kids with juvenile diabetes? Or did I raise that money because I want the camping set? If I land a camping set on you, then your brain is likely to decide it was for the camping set and make you less likely to want to raise money the next year. What about, so that's what the about recognition in the form of uh, public uh, accolades or being listed in the annual alumni manual or whatever it is? Much um, more powerful. Is it? Much more powerful. Yes, much more powerful because um, you are, uh, whether they want to or not, you're getting your identity strengthened because other people are seeing you. And, uh, you know, we have a, a desire to be consistent in our behaviors. So if other people see me in this behavior of donating or volunteering, um, I'm going to want to continue in the same manner. You know, we use things like hats and coolers and sweatshirts to reward people and recognize people because that's easy to do. Yeah. Getting you up on stage at an event is hard to do, right? And doing it consistently so we don't miss anybody, super hard to do. Right. And that's why we default to what's easy but wrong. Now, you were mentioning earlier, we were talking before we went on air about building identity for good. What yeah. do you mean by that? To use an example, we have seen a huge, huge examples recently of building identity for bad. And I'll use people who aren't in this country first as an example. <laughs> um, so Al Qaeda, they are um, brilliant at building identity to get you to believe a certain thing and then do something insane, like blow yourself up. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the way that they do it is very methodical. They uh, begin by reinforcing parts of, of you. You know, it's very stepwise and it's deploying what's called the social validation feedback loop. And so you get in a community, they validate you. That feels good. That makes you mo want to be in the community more. And mm -hmm. it turns into a loop. And that loop spins off a couple of things. Trust in the idea that you all share and trust in your teammates, trust in the people with you. So trust in the idea that you share and trust in the people with you will make you do darn near anything. And, and so it's, a identity herd mentality. Builders, it's like, uh, you know, well, all these people are starting to do this and they're getting recognition for it. I should do it too. So I that should I can do it too. Be part it of must team. be right. People like us do things like this to be part of the Al Qaeda them. team. Yay. Go Al Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. Yeah. And, you know, and it's very fulfilling. It's very satisfying to be part of a group like that. And I think what nonprofits, I know what nonprofits have not done is use those same techniques, huh. exactly the same techniques. We talk about it, but we don't do it. We use unicorn and butterflies language instead of science. And that's what we have to change. So you had used the term manipulate people mm -hmm. for good. Um, mm -hmm. That sounds kind of nefarious, doesn't it? It can be used either way. It's sort of like the word bias. Is the word bias, is that necessarily bad? No, it's not. I have a bias for chocolate ice cream. When you talk about doing all this inside the organization versus influencing people outside to volunteer and do all things good for the, the social good, how do you execute this inside an organization? How do you get the staff? Yeah. How do you get the executive committee? How do you get the board to buy into this stuff? Because they think, oh, this is a bunch of psychological mumbo jumbo being you know, sold to me by a, yet another consultant. But yep. You guys know what you're talking about. How do you do um, that? It's hard. Um, in its best uh, form, it is embedded into a strategic and operational plan. You know, not just as this is a thing we're doing, but this is the language we speak. This is the way we do business is building identity through these different ways to do it. That's the easiest and best way to do it. But you can do it inside an initiative, for example, a series of walks or a mission um effort. Uh, you can do it inside these pockets to prove concept and then build it from there. And, you know, those pockets have already proven concept. It's just a matter of understanding how that worked and then teaching it so that they can deploy it in other ways. Um, like any data set, you can spin the numbers ever how you want. And frankly, we have not interpreted the numbers that come out of particular initiatives and in nonprofit appropriately. We, um, you know, d the example I just gave with you and your redemption of a gift, we didn't spin that with theory behind it. We just made decisions based on numbers without understanding the real dynamics. So I think that's the first thing is helping 
the executives understand there's more here. You have to understand it more deeply in order to react appropriately and to use the fuel that is at your disposal. So they have to be able to harness this data first, don't they? They, And so a lot of these nonprofits, Mm -hmm. they have all this information, but they don't know what they have and they don't know how to how to sort it, parse it, and then make it into something useful. Is that something also that Turnkey can help the clients with? It is. We have people who do that. Um, it is beginning, that is getting easier and easier every day. Yeah. You know, that is, uh, it's, you know, the analogy is like, you know, no longer do we have cables in the back of the VCR. Now we've got Bluetooth. It's kind of like that. Like it's, it's getting much easier, which highlights. VCR? Really- What's a VCR? Okay. Uh, uh, I'm not going to make the obscene <laughs> hand gesture that I would in another setting, but, <laughs> um, the, you know, the, uh, it underscores even more now that, uh, analytics has become easier and cheaper, much cheaper. Uh, it underscores even more that you have to have the theory behind it. You have to understand what's driving it. You can know your data inside out, but unless you know the human dynamics that may be di- driving it, you'll come out with the wrong answer often. So we've been talking with Katrina Van Hus, who is the CEO of Turnkey, and they are experts in helping nonprofits build identity for good, for social good. And uh, if people want to get in touch with you, Katrina, what do they do? How do they get in touch with you? Two ways. You can Google my name, and I'm just very fortunate to have a name that's highly Googleable, Katrina Van Hus, or you can go to turnkeyforgood.com. Turnkey for good. Dot com. And when they Google you and they ask you for some help, what will you tell them? I will ask them many questions. One <laughs> of the things that we do that we take pride in is that we won't um, just embark on selling you something, but we try and help our, our prospects and our clients really define their situation. Because many times in nonprofits, you may have a great idea. It might be the right thing to do, but your situation will not allow you to go forward. So as you, part of our sales process, we help them understand that. So we save our skin, we save their skin, everybody's happier. Do you help them with social media fundraising as well? We do. Uh, we have uh, consultants who do that part of it. And it's all very interconnected. Um, you know, it's sort of like we used to say cell phone. Now we just say phone. And it used to be fundraising and, or social media fundraising or digital fundraising. It's just fundraising now. It's all, you know, like it, it, uh, the silos are quickly merging. Last question. Do you find that it's easier for nonprofits now because of online fundraising and, you know, doing it using social media than ever before? Yes and no. Yes, it is easier to raise money than ever before. But no, we have lost um, the ability to form community because uh, right now we do it best face to face. I think younger generations like your kids and my kids are proving that you can build community digitally. They do it every day. They maintain relationships and friendships every day. Yes. But people with money our age still aren't there. So we're in this weird, awkward So we go to the galas and they just go online and game yeah. with each other. Okay, yeah. I got it. But, but you know, their relationships you are as deep as ours. They're just different. My son recently got married and there were at least four people there he had never met. And he only invited like 80 people to the wedding. Wow. And they were from all over the United States. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's yeah, because it's of connections he's developed through yes. online connections and he had never met them yes. in person before. You know, yes. that's an interesting lesson. We'll have to cover that in another session. Maybe I'll cover it with Otis when we talk yeah. to him about the psychology of fundraising. Thank you so much for being a special guest on Blueprint for Wealth. Thank you. I, and let me in, uh, let me issue the invitation here. I'd love for you to come on our podcast and talk about donor advised funds. Ooh, I, I could do that all day long. Well, Excellent. not all day long, but we, okay. we'll love to talk about it. We Excellent. will take you up on that author, offer and we'll, we'll follow up with you. And thanks everybody for listening and watching Blueprint for Wealth. Tune in next time for a special topic and a special guest that's designed to help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. Have a great week. Mm-hmm.